We want to thank you for joining today's webinar, Food Truck 101, Taking Your Restaurant on the Road. We'll get started momentarily. All right, well, we're a minute past the hour. Again, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, we want to allocate as much time as we can to today's webinar and hear from our experts who will be particip participating as our panelists providing information for our food truck community. So let's get started. As we're getting started, we have two interactive questions for everyone. You will see these two statements posted in our live or featured feed that you will find in the upper right corner of your screen. It will look like two comment bubbles. So two questions, two statements will be posted. Statement number one is, I am currently exploring food truck opportunities. Statement number two is, I am currently operating a food truck. Please like which of these statements best reflects you on your food truck journey. So if you're thinking about or have or will be starting a food truck like that second one, if you currently operate a food truck like that second one, excuse me, I said that in reverse. If you are currently exploring food truck opportunities like the first statement, if you currently are operating like that second statement, again, you'll find these in the upper right corner of your screen. To kick off our event, I'd like to welcome the Executive Director of Economic Development and Tourism, Ms. Adriana Cruz. Adriana, thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon. Over to you, ma'am. Well, thank you, Jarvis, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Jarvis said, I'm Adriana Cruz, and I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Development and Tourism Office here in the office of Governor Greg Abbott. And on behalf of Governor Abbott and the entire team at the Economic Development and Tourism Office, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for today's Governor's Small Business Webinar. And I personally am excited about today's topic, Food Trucks 101, Taking Your Restaurant on the Road. Uh, I personally am a big fan of food trucks. Um, I do not own one, I have not had one, but I frequent them very often um, and I've been known to visit quite a few. So I appreciate everybody who's on this webinar who is thinking about uh, starting one or already has one. Uh, but today you're gonna hear from a panel of experts on the process of developing and creating a successful food truck business. Things like finding the right location, working through the permit process, creating a great customer experience and so on everything leading up to a successful opening day. Here at our office, we're committed to work with Texas business owners like yourself to make sure that Texas continues to be ranked as the top state in the country to start a business and to be an entrepreneur. Texas small business owners and entrepreneurs are the backbone of our state's economy, representing 99% of our employers and employing almost half of all working Texans and we appreciate everything that you do to keep our economy going. 
We've got a great panel for you today. I'm going to stop talking. I hope that you enjoy today's webinar and that it helps you as you pursue your, entrepreneur, your entrepreneurial journey. I want to thank our small business team, Jarvis Brewer, Brian Roller, Jack Harrell. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our office if there's anything we can do to help you as you continue to do business in the Lone Star State. Jarvis, back over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being here and for those remarks this morning. Uh, we know how incredibly busy you are in your role, and we know how busy the food truck operators are in the state of Texas. I can see just from that first statement, uh, just far 90% of you are wanting to explore food truck opportunities. So this event is definitely for you. Uh, similar to yourself, Mrs. Cruz, I'm very interested to learn about uh, food trucks and um, how they can be or how you can enter that realm. I actually was very close to considering joining that industry myself before um, exploring more opportunities with the state. So I'm very interested. I'm a frequent uh, customer of many food trucks here in Central Texas as well. So let's get on to our next set of interactive questions. Similar to how you answered those first set, there will be two statements posted in the Q&A feed. Like which of these statements best reflects yourself on your journey? I am operating or will operate in a major metropolitan area, or are you from a more rural or suburban area? Like which of these statements best reflects you? And that will help us and our panelists as we address some of the questions. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Joel Paprocki is a self-proclaimed vegetarian foodie has, who has spent years learning and understanding the ins and outs of the food business. So starting Ensure My Food made sense to him. A passionate supporter of the Eat Local Food movement in Austin, Paprocki is a founding member of the local Austin Food Trailer Chamber, owner of Capital Kitchens, and supporter of Naturally Austin and their Texas Restaurant Association. Taking what he has learned, he now shares his industry knowledge with food and craft beverages vendors across the country. Thank you for being here, Mr. Paparaki. And we will hear more from Mr. Paparaki. Let's move on to our next panelist, Ms. Janine Morgan. Janine Morgan is the owner of Seven Sisters Gourmet Food Truck and treasurer of the North Texas Food Truck Association. Seven Sisters Gourmet Food Truck serves organic, high-quality eats on the streets. Committed to using the freshest ingredients in each and every meal, the food at Seven Star Sisters Gourmet Food Truck is astoundingly flavorful and includes healthy Italian meals that are unparalleled in quality and taste, with a menu that includes chicken, shrimp, steak, pork, and veggies in a myriad of mouth-watering meals and options to always include vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free choices. The Seven Sisters Gourmet Food Truck has something for everyone. Look for them on the streets of Dallas and beyond. Thank you for being here, Janine. All right, well, we're gonna hop right into some questions for them. Again, later in this event, we will have questions tailored or from you, the audience, because I know many of you are here to get questions that you came into this event with, and we definitely want to address as many of those as we can. So before then, um, we have some questions that Joel and Janine receive regularly or some questions that are frequently asked that many people in this industry have. So over to you, Joel. This first question that I have for you is, what are the first steps an entrepreneur should consider in starting a food truck trailer? Yep. Thanks, Jarvis, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Joel. and. Um, the first thing I think that people should consider, any entrepreneurs should consider, is developing a business plan and really looking at who their target market is, what need they're going to meet in the marketplace. Um, sometimes it's easy to friends and family like your food and you have that captive audience, but really getting out and thinking through who is going to demand it, what need you're going to meet with your food truck, how you're going to operate, whether that's at office parks or focusing on just catering. Um, et cetera. So just really thinking through your business model and how that makes sense and also reflecting on what your strengths are. So whether that's your personality strengths, your skill strengths, or a particular food segment that you're really skilled at making. 
um, and looking to find a match there in the marketplace. And there's a, a few resources I like to recommend. Um, there's the uh, SCORE network, and I'll post some of these links in the comments in a moment. And there is a particular business model canvas that is used as a one pager. A lot of times business plans can be 20 pages long and they're not really looked at, reflect at, and always updated as you learn more. And so a good tool for that is called the uh, business model canvas. And I'll share a link uh, that has videos describing how, how that process works and how to think through that business model. So that's the first is developing a business plan. The next thing I would put really high up on the list is contact your local health department to determine what type of restrictions on your setup, your locations, your fire codes that need to be in place so that you can make sure your business models align with those because each area, each city can have different requirements where you can operate and how you have to operate safely. So that's two is to check with your health department and resources to understand your requirements for your area. Then from there, I would I would consider looking at registering your business uh, under an LLC. Um, you, an attorney will tell you LLCs can help limit your liability, isolate it to that entity uh, versus doing a sole proprietorship. And you could consult with an attorney potentially or and or a tax accountant to determine what might be the best fit for you. But really thinking through that first step, getting the LLC created if needed. Um, because that will lead into the next step, which is opening bank accounts and really separating your business expenses and revenues into its own bank account for easy tracking. Um, and you'll need to set up your LLC in order to do that. Um, I'll also post two, two links on resources because with opening the bank account, you probably should start thinking about accounting and how you're going to manage and review your finances. And there's some free resources um, such as WAVE accounting, um, which is a free online accounting software. And then there's paid services such as QuickBooks, which uh, the main advantage there is more customization, but also most CPAs, most bookkeepers, if you plan on working with one of those, will um, typically be familiar with QuickBooks, not so likely the other options. And then next thing I would look at is to look at your sales tax filing with the state to plan that out and make sure you have plenty of time to get that in place um, so that all the business side of your business is in place versus going backwards because that can cause a lot of um, you know redoing things or delaying things as you're trying to get started and get going and then and then on to you know that that side of things is kind of the maybe the boring part most people would say but necessary parts to the analytical side of it. But then next, maybe most consider the fun part, and that's buying a food truck or food trailer. Um, and you do it at this step because you can go back to what's your business plan, what's your requirements for your health department, so that you make sure you buy the right food truck or food trailer, whether used or new, that's going to meet those needs. Um, you don't want to get ahead of yourself and, and work backwards because that can cause a lot of unnecessary expenses and, and delays. Um, and then as you're looking to purchase, a food truck or food trailer, you need to start thinking about insurance. And, and really, I, I like to call it, you need to start thinking about risk management. And, and there's, there's insurance is just one tool where you can transfer that risk to someone else. But in reality, you really need to look at the business as a whole and what are my risks? Um, and so, you know, that can be anything from if I have mechanical breakdown and I can't operate, you know, you have to have plans in place um, for things insurance might not necessarily cover. Um, or you know, you know your food supplies, where are those coming from? Can you get them quickly? And, and just really think through the risk of the business and managing it and transferring it in some cases. Other cases, considering maybe I just won't do that type of activity because it's too, too much risk, it's too much variability, and you choose not to do that. But to, to circle back to the insurance side of things, there is one coverage that is pretty much a cost of doing business and will be required of you by um, you know, anything from commissary kitchens to the events you attend or if you serve you know, lunch at an office park, they're all gonna wanna see general liability insurance. And general liability protects you if a customer gets sick, if they slip and fall. It also can be, result from property damage that you cause unintentionally as well. For example, uh, uh, you put a sign out, the wind blows it, and it hits a customer's car and scratches it. That could be a property damage claim. So it, 
it definitely protects you and is a necessity. It also is, uh, I, I consider it, you know, if, if someone were to get sick from your food and you have general liability, you have a means to pay. So it's also a goodwill coverage where you're protecting your customer who is important. If something does happen to them, you have the means to take care of that. Um, and within general liability, like I said, third parties will require it, and it's a very common occurrence where they'll ask for a certificate of insurance, also called a COI. Um, that COI shows your coverages and also can list that third party as an additional insured. And what that does is it mitigates the risk that they inherit by inviting you to their um, you know, office park or letting you park at their food trailer park, et cetera. And um, if, you got, if you were to drag them into a claim, they would protect it alongside you. And so that's a very big part of the business because food trucks are mobile and you'll be dealing with a lot of different locations versus if you had a brick and mortar, you have one landlord. With a food truck, every place you go is technically kind of like a landlord to you. So it's very common occurrence and something that has to be looked at right away. Um, the other areas you need to consider as you grow, one would be workers comp. So there's general liability is injuries to others. So injuries to your customer, the public. Workers' comp is injuries on the job to your employees. So it's important to look at that as well if you start to hire employees that you have workers' comp because general liability will not cover injuries to employees. And then, of course, you've invested a lot into your food truck or food trailer. So you likely want to have property coverages if there is a theft, a collision, uh, fire, vandalism, wind, hail, et cetera, to make sure your investment is covered. And unfortunately, food trucks and food trailers, they are exposed to the elements. And so that's something that can occur and does occur and needs to be paid careful attention to and make sure it's covered properly. And that also includes your contents of your food truck. So things inside it that are not attached are not actually part of the food truck. So you need to make sure those two are handled um, you know, separately and properly. Um, the other aspect of a mobile business is that you are moving, you are driving, and driving is can be dangerous and injuries can occur. And that's actually where we see the highest dollar claims occur is driving and accidentally causing an accident. Food trucks and food trailers are heavy. They do cause an accident. There can be injury and property damage. And so auto liability protects you against that, whereas general liability covers you when you're parked and operating the business. Auto liability, you're driving, moving around. And there are other coverages to consider. Um, there's additional called excess umbrella policy that increase your limits. There's loss of income due to an insurance loss that can pay loss of income if you're out of work for a claim, say a collision claim and your truck's in the shop. And then the other consideration add on be like food spoilage. If you have a lot of food and it's um, susceptible to loss of refrigeration and you could have a, a large loss from that. So that, those are the initial steps that I would recommend uh, entrepreneurs consider as they start to their food truck journey. Thank you, Joel. And that was a lot of information. <laughs> However, yeah, I wanted, no, absolutely. We appreciate the information. However, I, I think that's a great um, uh, time for me to mention to our audience that this webinar is recorded. If you're like me, I have a pen and hand pad in front of me. Um, you probably don't write that fast <laughs> and you can at your leisure after this event this event or this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to two different places you can find it on our website gov.texas.gov forward slash business or on our youtube channel which you if you search for um economic development on youtube so you can view this information you can get the information that is shared throughout this event after if you miss it live um, a couple things that you pointed out there, Joel, which I think are wonderful. Uh, I was at an event a few years back and a person said it's probably a good um, thing for a, an entrepreneur, a business owner to have three numbers saved. And it's their attorney, their accountant, and their advisor. Uh, you hit on all three of those areas, being that your attorney can help you with the registration process and other legal issues that you may uh, run into as a business owner. Your accountant, of course, with the taxation, as well as your bank account and different items there. And then your advisor for all of the different challenges that uh, just a business owner may face. It could be another person, another business in the food truck or restaurant industry that can just pro provide that expertise 
and maybe some of the things that they face that can help you as you're going through them. So thank you so much for that information. Um, let's go into our next FAQ for you. Why is it important to join your local food truck chamber or association? So I think first and foremost, it can it can be a lonely experience being an entrepreneur. And I think having a like-minded community is is great just to share successes and challenges and, and learn from each other. So I think that first and foremost, that's that's the first key. And then the other the other is that we all have certain skill sets. And as an entrepreneur, you know, small business owner, oftentimes you have to stretch yourself into areas that you might not be as comfortable with and someone else may be very comfortable with. So to learn from other people from that group, I think is extremely valuable because we all have different skill sets. And then lastly, to have a, a group voice. So if there's changes occurring at the health department um, that may impact the food trucks, having that group voice to give their thoughts, their opinions to help influence that if possible, the different decisions that are being made for the industry. Sure, sure, absolutely. Let's go into this next question, Mr. Paparaki. What steps and considerations should I take in purchasing or renting a food truck or food trailer? Yeah, I think a lot of that I would focus on, you know, do I want a food truck or do I want a food trailer? There, there's people that will argue both sides and it's usually based on their business model. So I'd go back to your business model and and look at, you know, what where are you trying to target? If you're trying to target office parks and doing lunches, then a truck that can easily move around and is usually more compact in a, a space as far as how wide it can fit can get around more often. If you're stationary, maybe a, a food trailer makes more sense because you're not moving it often and a food trailer would be work well for that. And it all ties back to the business model, ties back to the health department. Um, every city can have different uh, requirements or regulations on what, what is allowed and the size, et cetera. So I'd really look at that. There also, uh, there can be insurance implications between the two. So a food truck is obviously a vehicle. Uh, it has to have auto insurance. Auto insurance, like I mentioned earlier, is, is usually where we see the high dollar claims paid out. So it's gonna be more premium for including commercial auto versus a stationary food trailer. You don't have that expense. Now, if you are a food trailer, but you're pulling it around every day, you're going to look very similar on insurance aspect to a food truck because you do have a vehicle and at that point you still have commercial auto. Um, so really just looking at, you know, the, the size, what your business plan, what uh, type of equipment you're going to need in there, et cetera, is, is what I really try to look at and, and think about carefully. Um, and the last thought I would say on that is the one advantage of a food trailer that you pull with a truck is you could always rent another truck. You can't really rent another food truck for the day, for example, that would be very difficult. But in a lot of the food trucks are older, so taking consideration that if you have to get repairs on an older truck, um, it, that, that could have you out of work for that time period. And so really thinking about that, you know, what works best for your needs and, and what you're comfortable, um, you know, working with. Uh, those are great points. In fact, when I was looking into starting um, my food truck, I didn't even consider things such as auto liability and that it is a moving vehicle or the difference between a food truck versus food trailer. So thank you so much for that information. Sure. Let's go to the next one. What should I know about food manager certifications, mobile food vendor permits and passing a fire inspection? Yeah, so for the food manager certification, um, you know, it's an online usually course self-study that you can take a test um, right online. It is different than the food handlers certification. So some people may have that, but the manager certification is needed if you're an owner of a food truck. And um, it primarily focuses on food safety and that's what the course would be going over. And, and usually, like I said, you can go to online course and, and self-study for that. Uh, mobile food vendor permits, those can vary um, by each city on the process for that, but I would definitely plan to check in early with them and also make sure to get on a schedule. Some cities will have certain dates that you can only go to get inspected and those could be, you know, a month out in some cases. And so just really planning ahead of time and thinking through that, how you're going to time it versus, you know, if you're trying to do an event that weekend and trying to get a permit, it probably won't happen. Um, same with the fire inspection. 
those are those can be different between each area um, and the main thing they're looking for there is you know fire safety so the gas lines are pressure tested so there's no leaks and I would also you know take a moment to I recommend a carbon monoxide um, alarm in a truck because most of the big type you know you might have seen in the news explosions that can occur are usually from a gas leak that has gone undetected um, so just from, from a life state safety standpoint, so to consider that in everyone's free trucks. Um, but the other thing they will look at in the fire inspection is, is there a separation from flammables uh, material and or grease from grills? If there's a protect protection between the two, they just want to make sure the chances of a fire occurring are, are reduced as much as possible by taking those safety measures. That all makes sense. <laughs> uh, however, I think many of us, as we saw, 90% uh, of the people here are exploring entering this industry. So uh, maybe many of us, if they're like me, hadn't considered those items. And then another from the other survey question, 75% um, are looking to operate in rural areas, which is a great segue for this next question. If I'm in a rural or not a metropolitan area, how do I choose a central prep kitchen, a commissary for my business? Yeah, and hopefully there, there's one nearby, but this is a growing business and I actually own a uh, commissary kitchen called Capital Kitchens that purchased a few years back. Um, and mainly what you're looking for and what the reason these are required by different health departments is you have to have the means to dump your dirty water or called gray water. So you can't just take your dirty water and just dump it, you know, in a field or something. So you have to be associated with a kitchen which has a gray water disposal system usually connected to the city and does it in a proper means. So that's really what you're looking for in the commercial kitchen. So location is a big key um, and obviously the cost um, that that need to do it and the responsiveness of the kitchen. Most time in most areas you'll have to get a notarized form from that kitchen basically stating that they are your central prep facility and they're basically vouching for you. Um, you know in a restaurant all this isn't contained within the building with a food trailer. Gray water does need to be dumped, your trash, uh, composting. You have to have a means to get rid of that and that's what the central prep facility or commissary kitchen facilitates. Um, on occasion some food trucks may want to do prep inside a kitchen um, so that could be a consideration if they have um, if they need to mass produce and rent kitchen space by the hour a lot of the kitchens will allow for that for an additional fee beyond the um, just the central prep letter um, and some will offer parking for food trucks so in some cities some areas you may have to bring your truck back to a commissary um, and by having space to park it that's an important feature in the rural areas, usually that's not required, but you still have to bring your gray water back and be disposed of properly. Yes, and I assume that's something that um, for the entrepreneurs, they'll have to connect with their city government to find out how to go about that process, correct? Correct, yeah, and if, if it is required, reaching out to the commercial kitchens are also a great resource because they're probably used to, you know, done 100 food trucks with the health department and they oftentimes have some good insight too. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joel. And we'll hear more from Mr. Pepperaki uh, later in the event as we get to the Q&A. With that, we are now opening the live Q&A. Um, so for those of you who have come into this event with questions or even just from the FAQs that Joel has addressed, you can now submit your questions. So look in the live Q&A feed again, upper right corner, look for the featured or published feed check to see if your answer has already been asked um, and if or excuse me if your question has already been asked and if you do see a question that you like please like the questions that you would like for us to ask to our panelists today that's how we will prioritize the questions that are asked unfortunately we will not get to all questions hopefully we can in this next half hour or so after uh, janine has had an opportunity to address uh, but we'll get to as many as we can so with that Welcome, Miss Janine. How are you doing this afternoon? I have a couple of questions for you today. This first one is, what are some of the obstacles that food truck entrepreneurs have to overcome to get started? How did you work your way through them? And you may be muted.
I believe you're still muted in the upper right. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. OK, so just to re reiterate what Joel said is it's, uh, it's very difficult dealing with the health department and the fire department from so many cities. That's my biggest obstacle. So this week we had four jobs in four different cities and we had four different inspections from the health department and four different inspections from the fire. So right there, your stress goes through the roof. So know, your, know the cities that you want to work in. Contact the health department and the fire and find out what the rules are. That's just just huge. And then what can you afford? Can you afford to go to 10 cities? If you can, great. Get permits for each one of those. And how do I work my way through them? Uh, I, I talk to other members, other food truckers and ask if it's worth to go to that city. You know, how's the money? How's dealing with the health department? For instance, Dallas is very difficult, so I don't go into Dallas anymore. Um, so just talk to the health department, call them up and find out what the rules are. That's w wonderful and a good point to mention that um, a lot of the permitting and requirements are at the local level. Uh, by the way, I actually probably should have mentioned this earlier in Joel's first FAQ, uh, he mentioned several steps to just initially get started. On our website, gov.texas.gov forward slash business, we do have a seven step process that we recommend anyone goes through who's thinking about starting a business, whether it's a food truck or otherwise. Um, many of those items that are on that seven steps are exactly what Joel mentioned. Um, one of the things on there is our <coughs> licensing and permits guide. Um, in that guide, of course, it's focused on the state level items that you would need to have to operate in the state of Texas. However, as Janine is mentioning, from city to city, there may be different um, permitting and both through the city the health department as well as the fire departments for operating your food enterprise and you may have to have what's called a um, permit to operate a food enterprise as well so thank you for mentioning that if you're looking at the state of texas we won't have all of these local requirements that you may have to have uh, from your city okay thank you so much let's go into the next question so where were you able to find mentors to help you when you were getting started janine Yes, I was lucky. Uh, so I, I was in California and I was calling Easy Slider. She's a really popular truck here. That's Miley. She's the owner. And also Jack Chalhound Terry. And they would tell me what to do before I got here. So I was a little bit prepared. Um, so talk to other truckers. Go up and ask them. I also asked if you have a lot of extra work, you know, send it my way. So I was able to get work right away. So That's wonderful. Now I'm mentoring a, a guy right now who's building out a truck and um, I think he laughed and said the other day you just saved me you know twenty thirty thousand dollars because you have to know your city's rules. You have to know how the height of your truck has to be 76 inches. You have to have a walkway of 30 inches and if you don't you have to pay variances. So um, hopefully you can find a mentor. I'm glad to see that you're paying it for it. You received oh. mentorship and now. Oh yes. Absolutely. So that's a great point. Um, you said that as you were moving from California to Texas, um, you had at least two other trucks that were willing to assist with you. Um, everyone yeah. knows the Lone Star State, but the Texas's official motto is the friendly state. And mm -hmm. in this community, truckers, other food truckers are very willing to help you in your journey. So definitely reach out. And uh, I believe Joel mentioned SCORE earlier score in the SBDCs. Actually, yesterday was National SBDC Day. SBDC stands for Small Business Development um, Center. The <coughs> SBDCs and SCORE are there to support you at usually no cost to you. So definitely recommend looking those up. All right, let's go into the next question. How do you find an identity, uh, or excuse me, how do you find and identify your locations and or catering events? OK, so so for me, um, like I said, I got some runoff work from the truckers I just mentioned, and then I literally just drove around big office plazas and walked in, introduced myself, find out if they had a HR department, gave them a business card or a flyer. Um, you know, I got lucky. We started in, in 17 years, so there weren't a lot of trucks. And I always say, hey, let just bring me out one time. I'll give you free drinks, try my food and our food so good and organic. Um, so that 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 helped us get more and more from there. You would get catering, but you got to go out and hustle, hustle, hustle. Wonderful, yeah. hustling, hustling, hustling. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. 
Correct. You're going to have to hustle. Next question. How do you balance the stress of running a business with your physical and mental health needs? Um, I think I'm dealing with stress, you know, every day. Like I said, we had to get four permits this week. And oh, guys, it's it's just crazy. The permits are crazy. Um, I, I'll we did our first double yesterday, so then I'll, I won't book anything for today. And then Friday we have a double and then I won't book anything for Saturday and Sunday. Um, another thing, if I do get work, I never say no. I ask if I can help you get another trucker. And this way I'm building relations with other trucks, throwing them business, and then they in turn send me some work. So go out and network with your community. If you go to an event, ask one of the owners. Of course, not if they have a line down the street, but ask, can I leave my phone number and talk to you tomorrow? And this way they can give you a little bit of help saying, don't go to this city, but hit this city. You know, go to your schools, go to your church. Hustle, hustle, hustle. So I have two takeaways from what you just mentioned. Uh, one being uh, the reliance on your community, other trucks, other people in your industry, um, their advice, and even what you mentioned, if you're going to an event, maybe having a second one to help with the networking. And then also spacing out, spacing out your, your events yeah. so you're not overwhelming yourself. Exactly. You don't want to... You don't want to run yourself to the ground and then come summer it's just too hot um it's just too hot for me to work i fainted a couple times on the truck you know you're standing next to that grill and it's 130 degrees um so after 2019 i fainted three times on the truck so then in 2021 and 2022 I, we didn't work in the summer so now it's a seasonal business are you going to have enough money to to not work you know health is important so you have to be careful with the heat. Oh, that's a great point. Um, I'm actually the business I was going to start was a Texas barbecue food truck. And so considering I got a very hot piece of steel, that's something to consider for the summer or right around the corner for me as a snow cone food trailer. Right. Uh, they may not be as busy in the Correct. winter months. So Correct. great pieces of advice. OK, moving right along. I see now that we have some questions. Um, I apologize that I noticed that the Q&A did not open immediately when I said it is open now. You can submit your questions and I do highly encourage as we have these two individuals here. We want to take as, as advantage of them as we can in this last 20, 25 minutes or so uh, while we have them. So please do submit your questions so that we can ask them to our panelists. Um, I'm going to look see some of them that were already submitted. Give me a second. Bear with me. OK. All right, so this question comes from Monica Frazier, and this is I'm going to actually throw this to you, Mrs. Morgan. Um, this one is related to I'm helping establish a food truck park in a Dallas suburb and want to know what fees folks typically pay to have a spot. Does a percentage of sales work? So I, I'm throwing this to you, Mrs. Morgan, because she's specifically talking about a food truck park in Dallas. However, the fees and all that, it's going to vary between city to city, park to park, and so forth. So uh, do you have any expertise on this type of a question? Yeah, I would. Um, I got a, a lot of questions like that. I would say, you know, you don't want to charge a truck or anything when you're opening up because, you know, the truck has to make money. So, you know, ask them for 10 percent in the beginning. You know, as you establish your location and you bring in a band and now you have a bar, you know, maybe you could ask for 12 percent. But in the beginning, it's that's a rocky road because they have to meet. You know, I can't come and sit there and make two hundred dollars. I have to make my minimum. So um, you could go to other truck yards and see how busy they are find out how long they've been in business and and learn from that how many trucks do they have on hand some people say hey let's bring seven trucks when they really only need two so you certainly don't want to scare away any truckers by having too many trucks so just um talk and talk to other truckers call them up and ask what what they felt comfortable if you is 10 percent okay kind of a, a personal question here as a follow-up to monica's question here um, you as a f food truck owner, uh, Janine, is there a preference 
that a food truck will have. Would you prefer a flat fee or have it be a percentage? Yeah, I think the flat, the ten percent is fair. Um, you, you know, you can't you can't pay for a monthly spot without having the knowledge of how much you you know you're making. So work it out with them. Let's let's try it one month. See how we do. Show your sales at the end of every every night, and then give a give a percentage back. Everybody wants a percentage back. But you know, if you do the Dallas Cowboys game and they want forty percent, I, I can't do that. Understood. Understood. Uh, there was another question submitted anonymously. Not really a question, but another comment, which I think you may have provided some insight to in your explanation there. Uh, someone said that I have an empty lot inside the loop and I would like to open a food truck park, but do not know which way to go. Is it actually this is a question coming from me? Um, do you think that we need more? Is there not enough food truck parks? Um, in locations, do you feel that there may be a limited amount of truck parks? I mean, if you're if you're planning on bringing in bands or, you know, your brewery and you, and you have a draw, sure. But if you think you're just going to open up an empty, empty lot and people are going to come, no, you're delusional. So you don't want to be right next to, you know, look at how many other food truck parks are in your area. Um, but. Uh, that's just a funny joke with a food trucker. It's like, oh, I'm going to open up a park and people are going to come. Well, for what? You know, you have to have beer, wine, band, you know, maybe jumpy jump house for the kids, you know, something to draw the people there. Absolutely. And sometimes we would say for every business, um, what makes you unique? Um, what is your attraction? What makes people want to come there? So even though this event is more tailored for the food truck owners, the individual owners, I guess this is a lot of good information for the park right. operators as well. Um, you still <laughs> have to bring a unique item just like the food trucks would have to do. So thank right. you so much for that. Um, I see Joel has joined us. Any follow ups on either of those questions? Yeah, I would, I would just add um, on the food truck parks. I mean, there are situations where you can have food deserts where, especially in rural areas where there's not a restaurant provider um, and food trucks can fill that void uh, quickly and easily. And so that can also be a draw in itself if you're not in a um, you know city area. Absolutely. That's a great point. Food truck or just food deserts. Um, yeah. So. That may draw that may actually if you build it, they will come type of mindset yeah. in that sense. If there is a need there, if there's a void. All right, I'm going through these questions again. Please submit more questions and like your fellow attendee questions. All right. So this is a question I'm going to actually throw to you, Joel, again. Um, the question is, how do you go about starting a food truck association? in a small town and actually both of you can provide your expertise on this this person wants to i guess build a coalition of food truck owners yeah i think you know the austin food trailer chamber started initially because there was a common need um and trying to grow in the austin area and so that you know by grouping together they could accomplish some of those things so there was a goal or a mission um, initially that was needing to be you know looked at and then over time you know and at least in Austin area it's been pretty friendly and so our association has evolved to be a support group um, so I think you can approach it either way I've seen them start through a common goal that whether it's permitting or whatever it may be or regulations or just the community and I think both are, are good reasons to to start and reach out to other people and see if they join that any follow up on that, Janine, about uh, restaurant associations? Yeah, I wish my my um, rest of the board members were here. Terry from Jack's Chowhound started it, so I certainly can't speak for her, but you see a need for it, and I believe you started it and got all the truckers together, and that's how they began. But that's all I can say because I, I wasn't here and, and set. I, I came to Texas in 17 and it was already established. Understood. Would, well, Oh, I would just sorry. add, I, I would just check, you know, see if there's one that exists already in your area. There are there are quite a few scattered out throughout the Texas area and to reach out and look to see if one exists. And if not, you know, look at joining other business owners nearby to uh, start a group. And if there isn't one that doesn't exist, a specific restaurant association or food truck association, there likely is a chamber 
in your area. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, that may be if you're looking to just start one from scratch. If it doesn't exist, um, maybe joining a chamber and association associating with the people in your industry within the chamber can be a good starting point to develop it. All right, I'm going to stick with you, you Joel, for this next question. As actually, actually, I lied. I'm going to you, Janine. Uh, this question is specifically to you and without giving dollar amounts, I'm going to ask this question. How much the question is, how much does seven sisters consider a good day? Um, so without talking about dollar amounts, right. maybe a percentage or what you right. envision as a good day for your business. All right, well, keep in mind, it's just my husband and I, and if I needed help like tomorrow, I'll bring one of my sons. So I have, I have low, low overhead. Um, I think there's a theory that if the lunch spot is $500, you'll go back to it. Um, if it's a Friday or Saturday night, you know, I, I again, if you have, if you're not working your truck and you're sending your employees out, I think 700 to a thousand, you, you need that for overhead and the cost of food now. And then remember you have the permit and wherever you go, they're going to want a, a, a piece of your, you know, they want a vig from you. So before you know it, that thousand dollars is now down to seven or 600. So. Um, you know, you, you just you just can't say I'll do an event that they've never had before, and hope for people to come. Um, my my first story is I did a government job. There was a thousand people, and we made a hundred and ten dollars. The lady didn't advertise we were coming, so it just has to be a build up event where they have you know we did it last year, and this is how many tickets the food truck sold. So I'd say anywhere three hundred to five hundred for lunch and a thousand for a Saturday night. That's fair. Absolutely. Joel, do you have any additional to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, some people will have a minimum to get some skin in the game from the people promoting it. And a lot of times from the outside, an event person <laughs> might not quite understand the, you know, the economics of a food truck. And they can also sometimes invite five of them out to an event that has a thousand people and that really can affect you. So not not being afraid to set your boundaries and if possible, make sure they have some skin in the game or at the very least they understand the expectation of what it costs to run a food truck and have a food truck at their event. Sure, so basically it may require you to do some calculations and setting um, what your limit is beforehand, before the event. Um, mm -hmm. I know one thing that I had to explore with the barbecue food truck was even just pricing all the way down to my individual uh, items that I have in my recipes. How much is my food cost going to be? Then how much do I need to make to right. take over those overhead costs that Janine mentioned, whether it's workforce or operation of the food truck, your um, food costs, everything. So let that be a guide of uh, what you would expect to make and whether it is, for lack of a better word, worth it for you to participate. And All it's, right. It's just, hey guys, it's just not the food. It's, you know, you're serving boats and a piece of foil. It's a little souffle cup and extra sauce. Everybody wants extra sauce. It's ice for your coolers. It's uniform, it's everything. It's your gas, your propane, again, your permit. Every little penny adds up and you better know your costs. Absolutely. It's hard to know your profits without knowing your costs. <laughs> All right, so moving along, um, I'll stick with you, Janine, for this next one. How do you deal with separate tax rates in different cities and counties? How do you go about dealing with all of the different agencies you have to deal with from community to community? Oh, man, I knew somebody would ask me this. So um, I, I don't go to Dallas right now because their fees are so high and they have a lot of crazy rules. For instance, imagine driving a UPS truck and right behind you there's an open space. Well, they want a doorway put in. OK, well, the next city, Plano and Frisco, that's a fire hazard. So now you take the door out. You got to put the door in. It's insanity. Um, so now I've been in Texas for seven years and I've established locations that I make good money at, so I stick to those cities. If by, if by chance I venture out a little bit past 30 miles, I'll get a one day permit for maybe Frisco or Prosper, if it's a good event. But it's the, it's the biggest problem is the permits. There's no state regulation. It's what I'm working on right now. And I've been fighting for for six, seven years since we got here. In California, they had a county permit, which was great. And I know other states have a state permit so it's something we're trying to work on now. 
Sure. So essentially, um, since it is desegregated at the community level, maybe that is something to consider as since most of the attendees here are thinking about starting their business, maybe identifying what those areas are where you would operate and knowing in advance what the requirements are. Uh, so that would be feasible uh, to make it feasible if, if you want to actually operate in that, if it's more hurdles in one community versus another. Correct. OK. Finding another question for us. OK, so this question was submitted anonymously and I'm going to open this up for either of you, Joel, Jenny. The question is, I am opening a food yard. My question is, would it be best for the food trucks if I install a large grease trap for them all to use? So essentially like com combining some of the items that I guess a commissary or yard would have um, to have it available for all of the individual food trucks that would use the yard. Uh, you, you get all that stuff done at your commissary. I would, I would have to. Joel, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, so the challenge there is that a central prep facility is more than just grease or gray water. It also is emergency refrigeration services. So the most of the cities that I, I know in detail of, um, they that commissary uh, letter it requires all those things, not just grease and gray water. Um, and so you would you'd have to actually build a facility with refrigerators in it and other items to meet those contracts to be be officially a central prep facility. And so it makes it hard for a food truck, uh, yard, park, et cetera, to actually provide all those services. So it sounds like they are trying to combine both the commissary and the yard, but not meeting really the qualifications of the commissary part. Yeah, there, there's more to it. And the one that comes to mind is, you know, access to refrigeration. So in theory, they could do it. They just have to keep, they'd actually have to have a building on premise, just not a grease trap set up. It could be convenient and a service. It's just not going to replace the commissary kitchen. Um, so you just got to be mindful of that. There's also some services that will come to you and get your gray water and dump it for you and pump it out. But that doesn't ne negate the fact that you still have to have a commissary, for example. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, this is an excellent question. I wish I knew if it, uh, who the person was who submitted it, is, submitted it anonymously. So I'm going to open this up to Janine first and then definitely want to hear from you, Joel. What is, what is something you look for in a location besides foot traffic? So we've already mentioned some of the things such as like the um, the permitting through the city, but are there some other attractive items to a location other than the foot, foot traffic? Joel? Yeah, think? well, I, I guess, you know, just from speaking with insureds, we've insured about 5,000 food trucks and food trailers and, um, you know, and then just personal experience going to food truck parks. Um, I mean, other other than foot traffic, I mean, I, I guess it all plays together, but, you know, have, have parking, easy access. It's usually going to be a requirement for most part, for most areas, but restrooms are important. Um, and the other thing is, you know, and back to Janine's point, if you have something that's attracting them, whether it's a band or something, they're there longer versus just coming and going. So maybe the ticket is higher per per order than it would be if it was just someone getting food and leaving. Um, so I think th those are the areas I would think about. Yeah, and when, when we first came to Texas, we would go to the uh, the truck yard and, um, you know, just sitting there for so many hours, people would come up and say, do you cater? And then from there you would get another job. So I guess the quality of the patrons is, is important, you know, to get another job. Absolutely. Uh, get another job just because of your location. Um, yeah. Which brings up another thing. So we've talked about the foot track, but we talked about the permitting. We've talked about uh, things such as parking restaurants and other attractions outside of yourselves. But um, what about your competition, like the item that you provide? Uh, if I'm sticking with myself, a barbecue food truck, am I in a location where there's four other barbecue restaurants within you know, a two mile radius? Um, am I unique in that aspect? So. Uh, do you think that is helpful if there is a ton of it or if it's helpful if you're a unique item? For us, um, 
you know, when, when we came here, nobody even knew what gluten free was for crying out loud. Now it's popular and we always have people that want the vegetarian and vegan. So we hit a little bit of a niche and that's what I think you should stick with if you're good at something. If you're great at barbecue and you got the best barbecue, you got to put everybody else out of business. So stay strong and be confident in your posture. Um, or you can venture out a little bit further and do maybe weekend events. I, I We won't do that, but you know, you could do the barbecue cook off or some, something like that. But yeah, just just figure out what you want to do and do it the best you best of your ability. And people will just talk about in order order from you. And, and what you do? Yeah, yesterday we did a school job, so they only brought one barbecue truck and then they'll bring, you know, two burger trucks and they'll bring one ice cream and one, you know, one taco. So. I, I would go up and just talk to another barbecue guy and say, if you have any extra work, could I have it? If if I was a barbecue guy. But if you're really good at what you do, you'll make money. Touche. Know what you do and do it well. Right. All right, we're coming up on the hour, but I'm going to do kind of a rapid fire on as many questions as I can in this last few minutes. So um, this one is about funding. Many people starting a business and funding is one of the biggest items and stumbling blocks that people have. Um, so Stash has submitted just trying to find funding places other than savings, friends and families. Where can we as a, aspiring business owners go for funding? How did Janine you fund your business initially? Well, we got lucky. I had a man who had been talking to for, for six months and then all of a sudden he said he'll sell me the truck. So I got lucky and got my truck for 11.5, but of course I had to put in all my equipment. Um, funding, uh, try auctions, try um, UPS or FedEx locations where they're getting rid of their trucks. Um, go to Facebook, there's food truck sites. You could see if you could get a truck cheap. There's people that went out of business in other states, sadly, you can buy a truck. As far as banking, I don't know, friends, family, savings, take out a loan. Joel will let you know. Yeah, so I, I see, you know, we're doing insurance. I see, you know, funding because there'll be a loss pay on the policy, you know, collateral. So what I've seen most, most of the luck that people have is through local credit unions or local banks that are willing to maybe have, have a relationship and uh, provide funding. Um, oftentimes you'll have to provide collateral whether that it may, may not be the food truck or free trailer itself, because those those can depreciate. They may tie it back to a home or other property um, to collateralize that loan. There are a handful of companies that will do equipment lending, but those tend to be very high interest rates, higher risk loans. And so they they're possibly options, but you're not going to get near as good of terms if you can arrange something with a local credit union or bank. Absolutely. Another area, um, just out of full transparency, um, we get asked this question quite often outside of just food trucks, but funding is a it's an issue for early stage businesses. Um, it's a known issue and many banks, whether it's even the SBA or um, private banks, Chase, JP Morgan, you name it, um, because of the risk factor involved in newer businesses, they may be a little bit more reluctant to issue even loans to newer businesses. However, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, are a great resource, especially for newer startup businesses. I um, highly recommend looking into a CDFI near you. It may be a great place to even develop some business um, credit, even with a micro loan, just to get your business's credit going so that maybe eventually if you need larger loans or funding, um, you can utilize the CDFI later. Uh, but anyways, funding, great place. And as Janine mentioned, maybe you can find the initial cost of your truck to be reduced through auctions and other um, unique areas. All right, I wanna get another question. It's 159 and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time here. Question anonymously sent, do I have to build a commercial kitchen before I can start my food truck business? Do I have to build one? No. That was a very quick answer. <laughs> just call, look up local commissaries and see if they have space for it. Yeah, and they and they will 
rent to you typically by the hour in most circumstances with a set minimum. So you can look at different ones, find what meets your need from equipment um, and the amount of time you'll need to use it, but you don't have to have a dedicated commercial kitchen for your food truck. And call the local church. Church has a kitchen there sitting. Mm -hmm. So again, you can be creative with how you go about using your kitchens. Um, you don't have to necessarily be the commercial um, kitchen or building it yourself. Do what you do, as Janine said. If you make barbecue, stick to making the barbecue. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we've come to the two o'clock hour. I definitely already feel that we need a follow up webinar to this event. There's a lot of information we still could go over. Uh, but again, I want to be respectful of not only um, our panelists here, but our audience here who cut out an hour of their day to learn about um, Food Trucks 101. So stay tuned. I, I personally want a follow up to learn even more, do a deeper dive. Um, but as we're closing, again, I want to thank our panelists, Joel and Janine, for being here. <laughs> Find them, Ensure My Foods and Seven Sisters Gourmet Food Trucks. We have their contact information. If you'd like to reach out to them personally, I'm sure they're more than willing to answer some of the questions that we may not have been able to um, answer here in this webinar. Or even if you want to try some of those vegan and vegetarian options, <laughs> there you go. Um, so Austin Food Truck uh, Trailer Chamber, if you're in the Austin area, there is a great um, resource and a great source of networking right there. You can see the email address as well as your link for the Austin Food Trailer Chamber, as well as in Dallas area, the North Texas Food Truck Association, their information. Uh, I briefly mentioned the SBDCs. Again, this is a federal and state um, organizations across the state. Um, they offer services which can be counseling and consulting services at no cost, typically to the business owners. Uh, again, I recognize these are all hyperlinked. Uh, these web, excuse me, these slides will be available in the next 48 hours from our site. So you can download these sites or download these slides as well as review this webinar within the next 48 hours. Next, please. Um, I want to give a shout out to the rest of the small business team, I, of course, am Jarvis Brewer, our small business advocate. Behind the scenes, we have Brian Roller and Jack Harrell who are doing some of the moderating of the FAQs as well as uh, helping us with the slides today. If you do have questions, as food truck, food trailer, or otherwise, you can reach us at smallbusiness.gov.texas.gov or if you have some licensing and permits question, again, at the state level, businesspermits.gov.texas.gov. Again, I want to thank everyone here for being here today. Uh, do follow us on all of our social media. You can find our, our next event on our events calendar, gov.texas.gov forward slash business slash events. Not only will we have all of our 15 in-person events across the state, but future webinars, which may include a follow-up to today's food trucking webinar. Um, stay tuned as we will bring more information to you. A survey will be going out right now, I believe. Um, we do hope that you will answer uh, the surveys and provide that feedback to us. That is how we tailor and decide the topics that we have in our webinars. So your feedback is very, very important to us. We want to hear um, what you thought about the webinar and what you would like to see in the future. And if you do have further questions, again, Janine, Joel, myself, and the rest of the small business team are here for you. Um, thank you all for being here today. I hope you have a great. Oh, go back. I do want to mention our small business resource portal. Uh, this is a great tool that we have. You answer five simple questions and you can receive customized, customized, tailored information for you based on your city, your demographics, and what your need is. So funding information is on there. Workforce information is on there. Networking information, if you're looking for associations, is on this small business resource portal. Highly recommend utilizing it. With that, I will close out this event. Thank you for your time today. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. <laughs>